Okay, welcome to chapter nine. We're gonna start talking about heredity, heritable traits, and uh, we'll have a slight introduction going over Mendel and his peas. Then we'll get a little deeper into it in the second video of this series. So first an outline. This chapter has a lot of new words in it. Well, maybe they're not new words to you may have seen them before, but this is where it's gonna be very, very critical to understand what they mean. We're going to use them as we discuss Mendel and his experiments with peas, his ideas or theses, questions that he proposed, and answers from his experiments uh, basically reveal an idea called segregation of genes, that genes can be passed on independently. So we're going to talk about that and how something called Punnett squares can be used to predict or determine the outcome of a particular meeting of individuals if you're looking at one or two specific traits. And we'll talk a little bit more about Mendel's law of independent assortment and the probability of offspring with particular traits based on dominance or recessive qualities, dominant or recessive qualities of genes. Now these first two slides are a list of the vocabulary that you'll need to know. You've heard this term before and I think you have at least a basic understanding of what it is, how it's a sequence of DNA that code for proteins in your body. There's a gene that dictates how to make the parts of it and how it's going to go. An allele is a term used to describe the state of a gene. We all know that genes control like the color of your eyes and there are many different kinds of colors your eyes can be so there are many different versions of that gene. So an allele is a way to describe a version of a gene like she's got the blue eye allele and he's got a brown eye allele but you know how you have two copies of every gene? So that way you have two alleles uh, for, well, if eye color were simple and it only required one gene, it's much more complicated than that, you would have two different alleles, like a dominant and a recessive. Say you have uh, one brown, gene, brown eye gene and one blue eye gene, your eyes would be brown. So the term we use for that is an allele. Dominant and recessive are pretty self-explanatory. A dominant gene is expressed over a recessive gene. And recessive genes are expressed only when both or all alleles that code for that gene are recessive. And uh, the dominant gene is expressed whether all genes are dominant or just one. So that's what makes it dominant. I believe homozygous and heterozygous you may have seen before. This is very common, a common breakdown of terms that you should be used to by now, where homo means same. So if you, your genes are homozygous, your alleles for that gene are the same. They're both dominant or they're both recessive. Then there's heterozygous. Hetero means different uh, in the most basic way. Uh, so your alleles for that particular gene are different if you're heterozygous. You have one dominant and one recessive as an example. So in that situation, if somebody has is heterozygous for a particular gene, so they express the dominant version and the recessive version is just there, they are a carrier of that recessive version. Uh, it may not be expressed, they may not even know it, but it's there and it's something that can still be passed on to their offspring. Moving on, genotype and phenotype, I'm sure are new words to you, and these are important words to try to keep separate. The genotype is the actual allele combination that somebody has. We've talked about, or I mentioned eye color just a moment ago. So if someone has brown eyes, their genotype can still carry a blue eye gene, where they have you know, two copies of a, gene, of a gene. One codes for brown eyes, one codes for blue eyes. So they look like they have brown eyes, even though their genotype is different. Now the phenotype is simply the expression that an individual or an organism has of its genetic makeup. So the phenotype is simply a brown-eyed individual. A phenotype does not actually describe the genes that are present. The phenotype just describes the expression of the genetic, ma genetic makeup of an organism. That sounds a little confusing, but we'll talk about it more. You'll get the hang of it. A hybrid is an offspring of parents that have a difference in one or more traits. It's kind of vague, actually. Everything could be a hybrid, but in scientific terms, you 
use that more concretely when, say, you're looking at a pea plant where everything is the same, stem length, pod color, pod size, seed wrinkliness, except one has white flowers and one has purple flowers. The offspring of those two plants would be a hybrid. And that would be a monohybrid cross because the two parent individuals are only different by one gene. A dihybrid cross would be when you mate two individuals that differ only at two genetic loci versus a minohybrid hybrid cross where the difference is just at one point. So when we start talking about Punnett squares, it's going to be really important to understand the difference between the P generation, the F1 generation, and the F2 generation. It's very simple to keep this straight. The P generation always come first, comes first because those are the parents. The F1 is the first offspring generation and F2 is the second generation of offspring by the crosses that you've made. So P for parent, F1 is the first generation, F2 is the second generation. Moving on to Mendel. This is a picture of Mendel and a picture of a couple of pea plants. He was a monk. I don't remember when, 17, 1800s, it's in your book. I'm not going to test you on the year in which he was alive. It's just important to know historically what scientific methods were at his disposal at the time. But Gregor Mendel did a lot of research on peas. He was a monk. He spent a lot of time crossing and growing and breeding peas. We're going to go into the details about how he did that. So why look at peas? Simple. They're easy to grow. They come in many readily distinguishable de varieties. <laughs> distinguishable varieties are easily manipulated so you can, well, A, they can self, which means they can fertilize themselves, or they're easy to manipulate the pollen and the, uh, not the ovary, it's not called the ovary, and the stamen, the anthers and the stamen uh, to control the fertilization that occurs. These are the simple traits that Gregor Mendel could look at in peas. So you could have flowers with, you could have peas with purple or white flowers, different flower positions, axial being further down on the stem, terminal being the flowers on the tip. The seed color could be yellow or green. The seed shape could be round or wrinkled. The pods could be inflated or constricted or green or yellow. They could be tall plants or they could be dwarf plants. And keep in mind the characteristics on the left or the traits on the left are dominant. The traits on the right are recessive for each of these. Basically what he did was he developed a population of plants that consistently produced offspring that were always the same. So say he had plants that would always be purple flowered the flowers would be axial, the peas would be yellow, the seeds would be yellow and round, the pod would always be inflated in green, and the plant would always, always be tall. After crossing these plants, cross-fertilizing them repeatedly, and several generations, um, the offspring would always have these dominant traits, meaning that they would be true breeding dominant plants. Like, they would at the end, you figure out that they've got both genes that code for these traits are the same. They're dominant, homozygous. And he developed that and eventually could try to mate plants that were true breeding of one kind with plants that are true breeding with another to see what happened with the offspring. And that's where his research becomes so very important and so revealing in the study of genetics. So these are the traits and characteristics he looked at in pea plants. And so that you get a better understanding of how easy it is to manipulate a pea plant or control their fertilization, there's a simple picture here, a dissection of the flower, where these are the petals. The stamen are here. These are the stamen with the tip with the anthers, and this is actually where the pollen is, is on the end. Those are the male parts of the flower. And then the carpal here is the female part of the flower. So what can happen before the flower opens, depending on when the pollen becomes mature, a plant can fertilize, or this particular pea plant can fertilize itself, or if you use the manipulations that Gregor Mendel used, you could snip the stamens or anthers off and then carry the pollen from 
the stamens of a different plant and fertilize the carpal of the plant of your choice. So he'd use, as you can see, a simple paintbrush and some scissors to control the fertilization of these plants. That's step one. So say this plant is a true breeding pea plant for all of the dominant characteristics. And say this is a true breeding pea plant for all of the recessive characteristics. Or, I'm sorry, forgive me, change that. This plant has all of the, the dominant characteristics, as does this one, except for one thing. These flowers are always purple, and these flowers are always white. That makes it much more simple when you try to understand the results of the crosses that he made. So try to keep that in mind, that every other trait about these two plants, individual plants are the same, just the flower color is different. So he crossed purple and white and would get the mature seed pods. So he's got several different seeds carrying the genes from both of these plants. Would plant them and they would germinate to create more plants and then he would track the traits and characteristics of them. So each of these are the P generation and then this would be the F1 generation. Now he would do this repeatedly, not with just four plants, but many plants with only a difference of purple and white flowers and then would germinate all of the seedlings to get a proportion of the characteristics of the offspring. So here you've got the P generation, a purple flower cross with a white flower cross. For the F1 generation, all of the seeds would grow and all of the plants would have purple flowers. Then Another cross would be performed using only plants from the F1 generation, so all of these plants carry the genes from the initial two, and they're all purple. So now you're crossing an F1 by an F1, and the offspring of that generation, the F2 generation, would be about 75% purple flowers and 25% white flowers. Very interesting, right? So for the parent generation, just purple and white, their offspring would be all purple, but all of a sudden it would skip a generation and this white color would appear again. This is essentially how it would happen. For that F1 generation, it's receiving the dominant gene for the purple flower and the recessive gene for the white flower. Assuming it's only one gene that codes for flower color, every single one of the offspring seeds would have a dominant and recessive, so therefore they would all express the dominant characteristic. And the F1 generation would be heterozygous. Keep that in mind. So the parent generation is homozygous. The F1 generation is heterozygous. And sorry, I thought they were going to talk about flower color, but they talked about seed shape instead. So um, the peas are germinated, and they are heterozygous, so the dominant trait will be revealed. Now this part is showing an F1 by F1 cross, right? So the gametes from this plant can give a dominant allele and a recessive allele, and the gametes from this plant can give a dominant allele and a recessive allele. So this is the F1 generation cross. Okay. What I wanted you to see in this video is how it showed you the process of doing a Punnett square. This is a Punnett square. So you put the gametes generally from the male or on the side and from the female or on the top. That's not a hard and fast rule, but sometimes it's easy to remember that way. And then you bring the gametes together and determine what the alleles of the offspring are going to be. So you bring this one over and this one down. This will be a homozygous because they're the same. 
dominant characteristic for P-shaped round peas. This potential offspring will get the recessive allele from here and the dominant allele from here. Still though, it's heterozygous and the dominant trait will be expressed, giving round peas. Same here, this allele is recessive, but this allele comes over and is dominant, thereby this providing this offspring with round peas. But then, finally, you get a recessive combination with a recessive combination, so this particular offspring will have wrinkled peas. That's the beginning of a Punnett square, and you're going to be doing a lot of them, probably. This will be the P generation, F1 generation, and F2 generation for flower color, as shown on a Punnett square there at the bottom. So you've got the two parents. It's a little hard to tell. Uh, this one's a capital letter because the purple is dominant, and it is this particular plant is homozygous for the dominant purple trait. And the lowercase p's here, even though p's are really hard to tell the difference, uh, symbolize the recessive trait for white flowers. So these are the only kinds of gametes these particular individuals can contribute to the next generation. Meaning every one of their next generation will be homozygous because each one will get one from each parent. So all of these plants have a capital P and a little p in terms of representing the alleles that they possess. This big P, little p is their genotype. Big P, big P is this one's genotype. Little p, little p is this one's genotype. But purple flowers are the phenotype. Anyway, moving on. So the gametes that this particular F1 individual can give to the next generation a little bit of each. It can give a dominant allele or a recessive allele. So potentially 50% of the offspring will get the dominant purple allele and 50% of the offspring will get the recessive white flower allele. So what this Punnett square shows here is a cross between two F1 individuals making the F2 generation. So potentially big P, little p, big P, little p bring the two big peas together, you have a purple plant. Big pea, little pea still makes a purple flowering plant. Little pea, big pea still makes a purple flowering plant, but you finally get little pea, little pea, and a white, making up the 75% or the 3 to 1 ratio. 75, 25, 3 to 1. And so the F2 generation is where that recessive trait may resurface in a simple Punnett square cross. Now, Mendel was able to come up with several hypotheses based on the crosses that he made and the attributes that he observed. So we're going to go through his hypotheses using modern terminology, of course. So there are, he was well aware that there are alternate versions of genes. This is what we call alleles. He knew that there were some sort of packet of information that was transferred between generations determining flower color. He was also able to hypothesize that for each inherited character, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. He was able to deduce that each parent contributed to whatever expression the offspring would have for any individual trait. It's not that only mom determined eye color or only dad determined eye color. Through the successive generations, and because that white flower showed up in the F2 generation, that's why he hypothesized that even though the white flower wasn't present in the F1 generation, that contribution of genetic material was still there. And so this is where, again, I want to mention that an organism is homozygous for a gene if both alleles are identical, like the parent purple flower, or an organism is heterozygous for a gene if the alleles are different. So those are the purple flowers in the F1 generation. Now moving on to Mendel's third hypothesis is that if two alleles inherited from the parent generation are different, one of them will determine the organism's appearance if it's dominant. The recessive one will only be expressed if a dominant allele is absent. So and then finally his fourth idea, uh, converted obviously to modern terminology, is that gametes, those are the sex cells, carry only one allele for each inherited character. Simply, mom and dad each contribute genes to build an offspring's individual genetic makeup.
So what this means though is that the two alleles for a character are separate from each other during the production of the sex cells. So whatever alleles mom and dad carry, if they're different, they are separated and then given to the next generation. This is what he calls the law of segregation. So meaning you don't get like half of each gene. They can't be cut in half. They are whole. They are complete. And since two, each individual carries two, only one of what they carry can be passed on to the next generation. So I don't know if you remember, this is what happens in meiosis, in metaphase one, where paired alleles are separated. So do you think Mendel's hypotheses account for the three to one ratio in the final generation? Does the outcome support his ideas? Absolutely, because if genes, if only one parent provided the material for what determined the genetic expression of the offspring, then both parents' phenotypic expression wouldn't eventually show up. That white flower would never show back up. And if those genes weren't separated at some stage before they were given to the next generation, again, that recessive gene would not have shown back up. So the four possible comb combinations of gametes and the four possible offspring all match up, or they at least reveal all possible genetic combinations. So this is just a simple expression. Um, luckily, because on the pea plants, only one gene determined flower color, one was able to be described as dominant and one as recessive. Um, because any possible combination of the two available genes was expressed in that F2 generation. Homozygous dominant is purple. Heterozygous would always show up as purple, but would be available to give that recessive gene on to the following generation. And since the F1 plants each carry one of the recessive genes, there is a 25% chance that their offspring will each inherit the recessive gene, thereby expressing the recessive trait. So now we're going to move on to one of Mendel's ideas that, or what he discovered by using the pea plants, is that you can, or that the expression of a particular genetic trait is not conditionally linked to another trait, or it does not have to be, where every time a flower or a plant, a pea plant has a purple flower, it's going to have round leaves. Well, he discovered, or I'm sorry, round peas. Uh, through the crosses that he made, he found out that that is not always the case. So each gene coding for each trait is transferred independently to the following generation. They are not all tied together. So uh, yeah, they're just not all tied together. This is sort of the law of independent assortment, and Mendel used what's called a dihybrid cross to discover that genes for different traits are passed to offspring independently. So he would cross two plants where everything was the same except for two traits. And by looking at the proportion of offspring that were developed, he was able to determine that by inheriting one character, it does not have an effect on the inheritance of another character. So if you're gonna pick plants with separate genes for two different traits, a simple four Punnett square is not sufficient because if the round gene and the yellow gene always traveled together, this would be the resulting Punnett square. These were his predicted results and that is not what he got. He had to generate a square where each individual trait came across separately, meaning that this is the F1 generation. He crossed a round yellow pea plant with a wrinkled green pea plant, right? So every offspring in the F1 generation would be heterozygous for the traits, although this is their genotype, the round yellow pea would be their phenotype. So he had to break it down individually. The dominant shape could be connected to the dominant color allele or the recessive shape allele could be connected to the dominant color allele, right? So you could have big R, big Y, little r, big Y, or big R, little Y, and little r, little Y. Those are all the possible, all the gamete combination possibilities. So you've got mom and dad on this side. And when you complete a dihybrid cross, the predicted ratio supported the actual turnout. So nine 
of sixteen plants had yellow round peas. So one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three of sixteen had green round peas. Three of sixteen had yellow wrinkled peas. And one of sixteen was double recessive with the green wrinkled. Meaning, the gene that determines the color of the pea is not connected to the gene that determines the shape of the pea. When you look at the ratio of offspring, you're looking at probability. It's just a simple estimate as to the chances those particular mating individuals the chances that those traits will be expressed in their offspring. So essentially it's like flipping the coin. This is what you have to keep in mind is the outcome of any particular toss is unaffected by what has happened on previous attempts. So I hope this helps. You have had a lot of new words uh, in this particular chapter. Please remember Mendel and his peas. We will definitely go over it some more in class and try to do some Punnett squares, at least when we get back from break. Uh, and I, what you need to focus on a little bit is seeing how each coding allele is segregated. This, is, this comes from your understanding of meiosis. Remember the genes are separated. You're going to want to know how to do Punnett squares. We'll do them when we get back and understand Mendel's law of independent assortment and how the probability of offspring, the probability of their traits are determined using these simple crosses.